certainly want to welcome everybody to this week's uh, Sage and Stern Path Unknown Happy Hour session. Hope everybody had a wonderful Easter weekend. And we're pleased this week to welcome Dr. Jennifer Vickers. Uh, this is the third time she's hosted one of our sessions. As you'll remember, Dr. Vick Vickers is um, board certified in dermatology and dermatopathology and actually practices both in Austin, Texas. And Jennifer is going to be guiding us through some uh, melanocytic tumors. Um, if you have any questions, we'll ask that you uh, uh, go ahead and, and uh, put them in the chat room and uh, we'll try to answer them at the end of the session. And uh, likewise, you can always uh, email us any questions or concerns you have <clears throat> at education at sagesdx.com or you can email me directly davis at sagesdx.com. Uh, so without any further ado, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Dr. Rickers. Hello, everyone. I hope you guys had a great Easter weekend. Welcome to Derm Path Happy Hour. And I just wanted to thank Dr. Davis for inviting me to participate yet again in one of the happy hours. It's always a pleasure and an honor to do this with you guys. My name is Jennifer Vickers. I'm a dermatologist and dermatopathologist here in Austin, Texas. And I work in the um, Austin location of Sages. And so today we're gonna to talk about melanocytic lesions. And you guys may have already know that just by looking at the slides. I wanna start with just a prototypical nevus, very bland, boring, but I want you to burn that into your brain because as we move into more abnormal things, you sort of need to know what the normal is before you can decide what's abnormal. So let's start with number one. We have a very um, boring looking nevus here, probably dome shaped. It looks very symmetrical. Um, looks like it's predominantly involving the dermis, but there is a little bit involving the epidermis as well. This isn't really gonna show us um, the perfect example of like the junctional component of a nevus, but we'll talk about that a little bit more going forward and I'll kind of talk about it here. You just won't see it exhibited as well um, in this particular nevus. So up here, we do have some epidermal involvement. So we have these melanocytes kind of hanging around. Um, they're not really forming well-formed nests, but that's okay. Um, so in a junctional component or a junctional nevus, you're going to see, typically going to see more well-formed nests that hang out at the tips of the reedy ridges. Uh, so I'll show you some examples of that a little bit later, but let's talk about the dermal component here. So you see all these melanocytes, they're nice and clumped, they're forming what we call nests, and that's what melanocytes like to do. They like to form nests, especially in the superficial dermis. What we want to see as we move into the deeper dermis is a process called maturation. And so rather than having these large, round, clumped melanocytes, they start to get smaller and they start to disperse. So they are no longer nesting and they're becoming more spindle-like and they have smaller nuclei. And those are called type C melanocytes, whereas the ones at the very top that were round and nested and clumped are called type A. And somewhere in between is type B, um, no surprise there. So if you see that maturation pattern that I just showed you guys where it's dispersing and, become, and the melanocytes are becoming smaller, that is reassuring that this is a benign nevus. Likewise, you're also going to see some pigment in the superficial dermis, but you shouldn't see a whole lot of pigment in the lower parts of the dermis in just a you know, bland, plain, boring nevus. If you do see pigment in the lower parts of the dermis, that can be a cause for concern, but there are some benign entities that also have pigment lower down into the dermis as well. And we'll talk about some of those. Okay, so moving on to number two. Let me zoom in a little bit. Again, we have um, involvement of both the epidermis and the dermis. And it looks rather symmetrical. And in that, this case, we do have the epidermal component sort of shouldering, meaning it, it's, it's present beyond the dermal component. So dermal components more in here, and you have the epidermal component going out to either side 
outside of where the dermal component is. And again, that's called shouldering. And when we move in, we see that we have some nesting, um, some nesting going on, and we have these nests kind of in the tips of the reedy ridges, reassuring feature. Um, but in this case, the melanocytes are also kind of moving up the sides of the reedy ridges as well. And we see uh, some what's called bridging. And so that's where the reedy ridges are sort of, sort of connecting with each other. They're forming a bridge. I do see some cytological atypia. So the cells are a little bit atypical, but not so much that I'm very worried about this. So um, we have the nest, we have a few kind of solitary melanocytes as well. That's kind of a lentiginous uh, component. We have shouldering where the epidermal component is exceeding the dermal component. We have bridging. All of those features are consistent with a dysplastic nevus. So this is a compound dysplastic nevus. We see some inflammation and melanophages in the dermis as well. So that's going to make it appear differently clinically as well. So dysplastic nevus here. Moving on to three. From here, we can see that it is nice and symmetrical. Looks to be very busy. Um, these melanocytes here are sort of exhibiting this windblown appearance. You can see they're kind of uh, all over the place. Let's move in and look at the epidermis. So we have some nests kind of hanging out at the tips of the reedy ridges. We have some solitary melanocytes. Everything looks to be behaving. Nothing too concerning there. I don't see scatter. And then the dermal component is not quite as nested as that first nevus that we looked at, but you do see kind of the bigger rounder melanocytes. They are clumping a bit, um, but no, you know, not a lot of perfect nests. There's some nests up here. And as we move towards the bottom, of the lesion, again, um, we start to see things disperse and the melanocytes are getting smaller and more spindled. So we are seeing maturation occurring. So this pattern with the sort of windblown look, this kind of busy look, you know, not really having the perfect nests up at the top, um, the melanocytes are kind of following down the adnexal structures and the hair follicles. All of this um, that we see, it, they're features of a compound congenital nevus. So, or we can say a compound nevus with congenital features. Congenital nevi oftentimes go deeper into the dermis as well than sort of your, your typical nevi. So just take some time to look at that. But it looks nice and benign. Cells are behaving, they're maturing. Nothing else exciting going on there. All right, so now we're on number four. Let's get oriented here. I want to start with this bottom piece. Nice and symmetrical kind of papillated, large round melanocytes up at the top. We have pigment up at the top. We do see some maturation happening. So they're getting a little bit smaller as they're going down. So just kind of a boring nevus. But if you look at this other piece, something else is going on. So you start to see these round and oval, large, foamy, clear um, cells. And the nuclei are small and hyperchromatic and they're for the most part in the center of these large clear cells. So these are called balloon cells. 
And we see them um, oftentimes in traumatized nevi, and we think that it's kind of a degenerative process. So while it looks very striking, it's not really anything to worry about. Um, it can happen incidentally in a lot of nevi. If 50% or more of the nevus uh, consists of these balloon cells, and we call it a balloon cell nevus. So that's what this is, is a balloon cell nevus. And um, there is such a thing as a balloon cell melanoma. So in this case, when you looked at the nevus, it looked very, it looked very bland and boring. It wasn't misbehaving. It was just a run-of-the-mill nevus. Um, so, you know, we wouldn't think that this is probably a melanoma and this is a balloon, balloon cell nevus. But if you did see some features of mel melanoma outside of the balloon cells, then um, that would be a different story. So if you see this one on a test, it's a great one to get uh, just because it's very recognizable and you should have the diagnosis right away. So that is a nice one to get on a test if you get it. So don't forget this one. Let's look at number five. Looks like it's probably dome shaped. Most of the action is right in here. We can see a pretty um, notable demarcation between this lesion and the skin outside of the lesion. So collagen looks normal here. We get into the lesion and it starts to look more sclerotic. So you have kind of the sclerotic stroma you have all of this pigment. So it's heavily pigmented and the pigment is throughout. So this is one of those lesions where you can see pigment throughout the, the lesion and it's not anything to worry about. Um, characteristic of this is, you know, these dendritic melanocytes. So they're kind of spindly, uh, they're intertwining in the collagen, the sclerotic collagen. And this is a blue nevus. In this case, it is kind of involving the superficial dermis, but oftentimes they will just involve the, the lower parts of the dermis. Um, clinically, they appear blue. That's why we call them blue nevi. And that has to do with the pigment being deep. It has to do with these melanophages that are sort of uh, intermixed with the dendritic melanocytes. And so you get a tindling effect and it, it makes the pigment appear more blue rather than brown. On dermoscopy, these tend to be very um, homogenous in color. So they're kind of this blue, black, homogenous lesion. And sometimes um, blue nevi can have sort of more of an epithelial component, but in this case, it's more dendritic or spindled. Those are benign. So moving on to number six. A lot going on here. You'll notice that pretty much the entire dermis is involved, starting with the superficial dermis all the way encroaching down upon the subcutis. And we see lots of pigment throughout. So again, you know, start looking for features of a melanoma when you see pigment throughout, but in this case, it is not a melanoma, it is benign. And this entity has kind of two different cell populations. You have these fascicles of these plump spindled cells. They are lighter, the cytoplasm is lighter. They're kind of a light blue and they're intermixed with those same sort of dendritic melanocytes that we saw in the last common blue nevus. And they, this whole thing is kind of forming a shape that um, is reminiscent of a dumbbell. So you have it sort of spreading out in this wedge shaped pattern here. It tapers in the center and then it spreads out again down at the bottom. So that gives you that dumbbell shape. And when you see that, as well as this like tongue-like projection of these blue cells, you want to think about a cellular blue nevus and that's what this is. So cellular blue nevi tend to be bigger than the common blue nevus. They're more like nodules as opposed to papules. Again, they should be sort of homogenous on dermoscopy. So fairly striking appearance. Again, mixed to two different cell types, tongue-like projection of these uh, lighter cells. It's the shape of a dumbbell in the dermis and it involves the entire dermis as well. 
cellular blue nevus. Okay, moving on to number seven. So this lesion is fairly symmetrical. Look it over a little bit. Both sides end on a nest, which is a benign finding. It's not going very deep in this particular lesion. And if you get into the epidermis, it's rather striking. So you see all these melanocytes, but they look different than the other nevi that we've been looking at. And they might even look a little bit scary to you. But in this case, um, they're more spindled. So they tend to have a vertical orientation. They're said to look like bunches of bananas. They also will have this retraction artifact. That's a pretty common finding in this particular type of nevus. And you can see they are still nesting and for the most part, hanging out at the DEJ. If you look at the dermal component, you have these larger rounder cells as opposed to spindled cells and they're more epithelioid. All of these characteristics are what we see in a spitz nevus. So clinically, these can be dome shaped. They tend to be on younger people. In fact, we're reassured if they're on kids um, they should not be popping up on a 50 year old. If they do, then that's more concerning for a spitzoid melanoma. Um, but in this case, this is looking benign. Like I said, nice and symmetrical, begins and ends on a, a nest. The cells are behaving for the most part. You may see some pleomorphism, but you shouldn't see, um, you know, severe atypia. And they oftentimes will have a lymphocytic inflammatory infiltrate underneath them or kind of within the dermal component. So all of that is what we expect to see in a benign spitz nevus. One thing that I'm not seeing on this particular entity, at least not easily seeing, is something called a Camino body, and that's also a feature of a spitz nevus. So those are PAS positive pink um, aggregates that kind of have scalloped borders that we find in the epidermis, oftentimes around the DEJ. And if you see those, that should be a reassuring sign that this is more likely a spitz nevus as, to, as opposed to something more sinister. But like I said, I'm not seeing a great example of that in this particular nevus. I would encourage you guys to go look that up so that you do know what they look like because it can be a great clue when you're trying to figure out what these are. So spindled melanocytes in the epidermis, they're nested, they're vertically oriented, look like bunches of bananas. Um, and then more epithelioid, pleomorphic looking cells down in the dermis. So that's the dermal component of a spitz nevus. You see some pigment throughout. Not all of them have this much pigment. You see um, inflammatory infiltrate. So that is a spitz nevus. Moving on to number eight. One of the first things you should notice about this entity is this part here in the dermis. So it's lighter in color. The collagen looks a little bit different. So let's see what's different about it. So the collagen is oriented in sort of an east to west orientation and the vessels are going north to south. So what do you guys know that has east to west collagen and north to south vessels? That is a scar. So it's very likely that this patient had a nevus biopsy previously and it looks like it is starting to come back. So you see these melanocytes at the DEJ um, they are not well nested. There's not well formed nests there. A lot of them are solitary, um, kind of confluent. So in a lesion that didn't have a scar, this would be concerning. We would start to think about maybe an early melanoma in situ, um, lentigo maligna. But in this case, it is overlying the scar. And so it's not melanoma. It's something called pseudomelanoma 
which happens in scarred nevi and recurrent nevi. So this is a recurrent nevus. Sometimes you can even see a little bit of some scatter. I wouldn't say a significant amount, um, but yeah, these findings outside of a scar are not good, but overlying a scar are just fine. Now let's say you saw something like this, but instead of being above the scar, it was over here where the scar doesn't exist. That would be reason for concern. So you would start to think about um, potentially a, a melanoma in situ that had been missed. Sometimes nevi can get traumatized and you'll get a scar in the nevus just from the trauma. Maybe they've been scratched or cut or bumped. Um, and when that happens, you can get recurrent features in the epidermis as well. Um, and they'll, it'll look like pseudomelanoma, but if you see that the scar is present from that trauma, then again, it's not anything to worry about. So this is an interesting little lesion. Let's see what's going on here. Let's start on this side. So on this side, there's clearly a junctional nevus. It doesn't look too bad. It's nesting, just kind of a normal amount of melanocytes, kind of boring, nothing to really say about that. But as we move over, you start to see this kind of dense inflammatory infiltrate. So what is happening over here? And the epidermis starts to look a little bit different. So all of a sudden we're seeing lots and lots of melanocytes, confluent melanocytes. In some areas, there seems to be even more melanocytes than keratinocytes down at the, the DEJ at the bottom of the epidermis. There are a few nests, but they're not very well nested. It is not symmetrical. You kind of have this beautiful nevus on one side and then over on this other side, the pattern completely changes. So it's asymmetrical. And you also see um, some scatter. So you can see these melanocytes kind of hanging out closer to the stratum corneum where they should not be hanging out. So that's pagetoid spread or scatter. And again, lots and lots of melanocytes here. So in this case, this patient probably had just a, a plain Jane um, junctional melanocytic nevus that is now transforming into a melanoma in situ. And the body is sensing that something is wrong here. So it's sending in this inflammation to try to take care of it. So sometimes even just seeing that inflammation, even though you can get an inflammatory infiltrate in a benign nevus, seeing that dense of an inflammatory infiltrate um, combined with these atypical features is, uh, is concerning and would make you want to look for something like a melanoma. There's lots of cell atypia, severe atypia here. The cells just kind of look like they're doing whatever they want. So melanoma in situ, rising in association with a junctional nevus. And then um, this little lesion actually has a bonus for you guys. And I think it's just an incidental finding. I don't think it actually has to do with the melanoma in situ or the nevus. But if you look at the epidermis here, you guys may have noticed that it doesn't quite look normal. So you have this acantholysis, the cells are sort of breaking apart. When you get in a little bit closer, um, you start to see that the cells are getting sort of smudgy and gray and kind of the, the buzzword here is gunmetal gray. And the cells are kind of doing some funky things. You have some multinucleated cells here and the nuclei are sort of conforming to each other. They're molding. So that's called nuclear molding. And then um, you also see like in this cell here is a great example of it. It almost looks like it has like an eggshell. So the chromatin in the cell is being pushed out to the margins, the periphery of the cell and forming this almost like outline or eggshell appearance. And that is called uh, chromatin margination. So there's three M's here. We have multinucleation, we have nuclear molding, so um, multinucleated cells, molding is the second M, and then margination is the third M. In conjunction with this gunmetal gray appearance and this acantholysis, so this person is not a very lucky person 
um, they have a nevus that is turning into a melanoma in situ. And within this nevus melanoma in situ, they also have herpes. So these are the changes that we see with a herpes simplex infection. These are the viropathic changes that you see with HSV. Um, so yes, this person has a lot going on, unfortunately for them. So yeah, little derm path bonus there. Okay, so now we have a punch. You guys may have noticed that the skin um, here has a very, very thick stratum corneum. So that should give you a clue about location. So this is likely acral, so probably the palms or the soles. And we're seeing a bunch of melanocytes here. Some of them are nesting. Some of them are not. And immediately, this looks concerning to me. Uh, there's a lot of cytological atypia. The pattern is a little bit chaotic. It's not symmetrical. There are a lot of melanocytes. And then we also see some scatter, some pagetoid spread. So you can see these melanocytes kind of creeping up towards the upper parts of the epidermis. Now, that being said, acral nevi can have some of these features and still be okay. Particularly in the center of the nevus, you may see some scatter or patchoid spread. You may see um, a pattern that looks a little bit more aberrant than your typical benign nevus on other parts of the body. But in this particular case, it's just too much. There's too much atypia, the pattern is too chaotic, there's too much scatter. So in this case, this is an acral melanoma. And you see both lentiginous and nested patterns here, but it is just not looking good. Okay, moving on. You're now on number 11. We are getting close to the end. Let's see if I can get this to work. So in this case, I want to start with the epidermis. And there is some badness going on up there. I am seeing a lot of melanocytes. I'm seeing some nests. I'm seeing lots of solitary melanocytes, so kind of a lentiginous component. Um, I am seeing a lot of atypia, so severe atypia. And if you look here, I mean, just look at the number of melanocytes here. That's way too many melanocytes that are just kind of doing whatever they want. Look at all of this atypia here as well. So this particular lesion is not behaving. And we can say without even looking at the rest of it that there is at least a melanoma in situ here. Now, if we look in the dermis, you can see all of these spindle cells. And it's going really deep. In fact, it's starting to get into the fat. And one of the other pieces, you can see that it is in the fat down here. And so they don't really look like what you would expect melanocytes to look like, but these are melanocytes. Now let's say you did not have this epidermal component, which happens a lot in this entity, which I'm about to tell you what it is, but this happens a lot in this entity. Let's say that all you saw was a normal epidermis and then all of these spindle cells. It would be pretty difficult to say exactly what is going on here, but we do know that there is something going on here. So you start to think about um, things that have spindle cells that are, that are bad. So um, when I was in residency, we used, um, we used the mnemonic SLAM. So those are things that sort of slam against the epidermis, they're dermal and they're spindled cell. And so you want to distinguish between a spindle cell, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, so spindled squamous cell carcinoma, 
Um, so that's the S. The L is leiomyosarcoma. The A is an AFX. And then the M is a melanoma. So as you guys know, we are discussing melanocytic lesions and we've already seen this melanoma in situ up here. So this very likely is a melanoma. We have lots of clues to tell us that, but if we wanted to stain it to make sure, you know, like I said, let's say we didn't have that epidermal component and we wanted to stain it to see what's going on. Um, the thing that would help us identify a, a melanoma is S100. So this is specifically a desmoplastic melanoma. And they can be very difficult to diagnose, um, particularly if the patient had already had something cut out there. They can look very similar to a scar and can oftentimes be difficult to distinguish from a scar. Um, they can look identical to those other entities that I was just talking about with the SLAM mnemonic. Um, but they should stain for S100 throughout the lesion. The tricky part about desmoplastic melanomas is that they oftentimes do not stain with H and B. So H and B and a benign nevus is going to stain kind of the upper parts of the lesion and will start to fall off as you get down to the lower parts of the lesion where that maturation is occurring. So if you're trying to decide between a benign nevus and a melanoma and you want to use H and B to do so, the melanoma oftentimes will have kind of patchy H and B staining throughout the lesion itself and not just limited to the superficial areas. Um, However, when you're looking at a desmoplastic melanoma, the H and B can fall off altogether. And so it may be completely negative. Same thing with a MART. So if you order a MART stain and you order an H and B trying to find this melanoma, it may not show up. So the S100 is going to be what you need to use to distinguish a desmoplastic melanoma. You can also use SOX10. Um, unless something has changed since I trained, the question that they, they usually ask is, you know, what stain do you want to get with the desmoplastic melanoma? And the answer would be S100, because that is going to be more reliable. But hopefully, you know, if you do run across one of these, you have this epidermal component, this melanoma in situ, to tell you that um, there is a melanoma here, but oftentimes the desmoplastic melanomas do not have that epidermal component. So we don't get that lucky. But in this case, we did have it. So uh, again, desmoplastic melanoma, it has these spindle cells, it goes deep, it's encroaching into the fat. Um, we have the in situ component to help us with this one, but if we did not, we would want to do stains and we would want to distinguish it from those other things that I just talked about. So that's sort of the classic list, that SLAM. Um, there are other entities that can look similar to this that you would want to learn about, but sort of the, the fast and easy way to remember it is the SLAM. So squamous cell carcinoma, leiomyosarcoma, atypical uh, fibroxanthoma, and then which AFX, and then um, the desmoplastic melanoma. All right. Last one, guys. Thank you for hanging in there, especially after a holiday weekend. You guys may have had a lot of candy um, for Easter, and so you may be kind of in a coma, candy coma. Um, but thank you for hanging in so far. We are on the last one. So let's just get through this one really quickly. So if we're looking at this piece of tissue, very nice, normal looking nevus. We have some nice nesting. Melanocytes look very bland, no atypia. Nothing really to write home about. Maybe a little bit of some inflammation but for the most part, boring. However, we can see that that is not the case in this piece. And you have this sort of nodule growing within the nevus and a couple of things you may be thinking about. Is this a melanoma? That's a very legit question. Or is something else going on? So moving in, you see these, um, very round, large epithelioid cells with lots of cytoplasm. And they have this kind of like well demarcated edge to them. Like the cytoplasm is very well contained. So they almost look like eyeballs. You do see some pleomorphism. You may see a mitotic figure here and there, but it should be um, a typical mitotic figure, not an atypical mitotic figure, and there shouldn't be a lot of them. 
So it kind of has a distinct look. So we know this is a nevus. We know there's sort of that uh, normal nevus component. And then we have this nodule here. And when you see this, what should come to mind as a possibility is something called a bapoma. And that's kind of a cute name that we've given these things, but really the official name is um, BAP1 inactivated melanocytic nevus. So when I uh, was training, these guys were sort of, we were just learning about them. And I remember I had a patient as a resident that had these, we found some unusual nevi in his scalp. And when we biopsied them, this is what it looked like had these giant epithelioid, epithelioid cells in sheets with pleomorphism. And our attending recognized it and recommended that we order a BAP1 stain. So in this case, we have a BAP1 stain. Let's see what it shows us. So if you look at the nevus here and here, just the regular part of the nevus, you see that it is staining for BAP1. So BAP1 is intact. But when you look at this nodular component, there are some small melanocytes in there that are staining positively, but those big sheets of cells are not staining for BAP1. So the BAP1 is inactivated, which is why it's called a BAP1 inactivated melanocytic nevus. Well, what does that mean? So what we found out is that when people lose BAP1, that it actually predisposes them to a syndrome where they are at greater risk for certain kinds of cancers. And this is one of those things that they might ask you on a test. You know, what is the most common cancer that you see with BAP1, loss of BAP1 and the syndrome associated with it? And the answer to that would be uveal melanoma. Uh, I want to say another really common one is mesothelioma. So just remember those two especially. Now, there are other cancers that are associated with the syndrome, but the most common one is the uveal melanoma. So if you do see um, BAP1 inactivated melanocytic nevi in a patient, then you need to start diving into their family history, their personal history, and you need to counsel them on the risks that are associated with the loss of BAP1. Um, so it's a good one to recognize. Like I said, they're very distinct. So you have this nevus here, and then you have this nodule that's sort of growing in the middle of the nevus. And within that nodule are these large, um, kind of lighter looking cells with, with abundance of cytoplasm. They have well-contained cytoplasm. They have pleomorphism and they're interspersed with these small, um, smaller melanocytes as well. And then when you do the stain, they show a loss of BAP1. So remember that one and remember the associated questions with it. You might have kind of a, you know, second level question where they show you this and they, they don't tell you what it is, but they say, you know, what is the most common cancer associated with the syndrome? So you'll need to be able to recognize that it is a BAPOMA. You'll need to recognize that there's a loss of BAP1, and then you'll need to uh, remember what cancers are associated with that syndrome, particularly the most common. So just bear that in mind uh, in case it comes up on a test. All right, guys, well, that'll do it. So we, we finished up all of the lesions. Hopefully you guys learned something today. If you have any questions, um, please reach out to Sages. And I, I believe that you guys will be given the information in order to do so. Um, so send your questions to us. We will definitely try to get back with you and let you know what the answers to those questions might be. Uh, I appreciate your attention today and your participation. And I, I always enjoy doing this with you guys and hopefully I'll get to do it again. And as I said, I hope you had a great weekend and a great rest of your week and you let us know if you need anything at all. All right, guys. Take care. Thank you, Jennifer. Really, really good job. Um, <clears throat> just in closing, we did have one question from Dan uh, here asking uh, about distinguishing blue nevi from pigmented uh, nevus of reed. And, and I think, Dan, most people view 
uh, the Reed's tumor as a variant of a Spitz nevus. So people will talk about a pigmented spindle cell variant of a Reed's nevus. <clears throat> Blue nevi, as uh, Jennifer pointed out, are intradermal lesions. Uh, a blue nevus will not have a junctional component for one thing. Pigmented spindle cell nevus of reed always has a junctional component. So it's either gonna be junctional or compound. Uh, you know, I've never seen anything I've called an intradermal variant of a pigmented spindle cell nevus of reed. So that's one thing. Uh, a, a reed tumor will have a junctional component. Blue nevi do not. The junctional component of a pigmented spindle cell nevus of reed is usually pretty striking. Uh, it bears a lot of similarity to the spitz nevus that we looked at that Jennifer discussed. The nests of melanocytes tend to be large, vertically oriented. The cells are clearly spindled and the nested aggregates are heavily pigmented. There's a lot of melanin pigment. Uh, within, the, uh, within the melanocytes. Also, it tends to have a lot of the attributes of a Spitz nevus. It will be very sharply circumscribed, very symmetric. Uh, there's usually hyperkeratosis, hypergranulosis, uh, epidermal hyperplasia, and at times comino bodies too. So hopefully, hopefully that will help. And uh, next week, I'm gonna be discussing uh, some common differential um, uh, diagnoses. I, I was going to go ahead and present the, the six things I'm asked about a whole lot uh, or that we've been asked about over the course of the uh, last year. One of the things that we're going to be looking at is the, the uh, distinction between a deep penetrating nevus and a cellular blue nevus. So uh, I thought that might come up today, but we'll, we'll go ahead and address that next week. Thank everybody for, I uh, want to thank everybody for participating. And again, let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Have a good evening.